Thank you everyone for joining us today, either in person or virtually, to launch the third phase of Foundations for Belonging Research. This is incredibly important work, which offers insights into the social impacts of COVID-19 on newly arrived refugees in Australia. I have to say it's a delight to be able to gather here in person. I understand the last two phases of this research were done via Zoom, so it's always fantastic to be able to gather in person to discuss this um, incredibly important work. This research is conducted by Settlement Services International in partnership with the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. I'm Lydia Fang from ABC News and I'll be your MC for today. Before we begin today's event, I would like to introduce Uncle Michael West from the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council to formally welcome us all. Pajadi Gamarura Gadigal. Good morning and welcome to Gadigal, where we are here today. Um, congratulations on <clears throat> Settlement Services International and Western Sydney University for um, when and we are in Science Week. So it's important to do the right research and understand. And about belonging so important because as humans, we are, uh, when you think about it, we need to belong to tribes. We need to belong to our tribe and we belong to ultimately one tribe one mob and that's humanity i know um we don't see this as uh, when we look at the news at night we see this isn't always respected but we need to re treat people with respect and dignity don't we you treat people the way you want to be treated when i think about it um and aboriginal people we joke about this that um to us cook is a boat person we shouldn't <laughs> We shouldn't treat people differently by their mode of transport getting here, should we? No. Um, we shouldn't torture people and we shouldn't disrespect them. It's important we understand and respect that we all belong to that one mob, one tribe humanity. As I said, the land we're on is the land of the Gadigal, one of the 29 clans of the Ora Nation. Across that beautiful coat hanger, um, you've got Camaragal, and next door to here is Wongal. And next door to Camaragal is Wallamadigal. You keep going, you hit Parramatta, Barramadigal. And Aboriginal people, we have been doing trade for more than 65,000 years amongst ourselves, but we also did trade with the Macassans up the top end and others. When you get a chance, have a look at Vatican Hunting Bird Manuscript and you'll see that there's a very familiar bird in there that causes a lot of chaos around here, um, a lot of noise and likes chewing things. <laughs> and as I said, I know the previous government said they did the tr first trade agreement with Asia and Indonesia a few years ago. But if you've been trading for four or five hundred years with Asia and the Macassans, obviously that what they said was obviously fake news. <laughs> <laughs> and we need a bit of a laugh, don't we, in the times we're living. We're still going through a pandemic. Um, it's also important we take a moment to pay respects to country, um, all country, because Mother Earth has been talking louder and louder and screaming now about how we're disrespecting her. Everything we have comes from her, and we will return to her one day. So it's important we take a moment to pay respects to country and also pay respects to our ancestors and pay respects to the elders. So if we just take a moment and also reflect our journey right here, right now, and how we can build a more inclusive society um, where we treat people with respect and dignity. We have the Hawkesbury, Nepean, Georges. And Mother has been talking to us because those three rivers have been flooded of late. The wonderful land that we live on is been cared for more than 65,000 years. On behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, our members, our elders and our board, we welcome everyone here today. Um, to my Aboriginal Torres Strait on brothers and sisters, if any are out there or online, I think, um, we warmly welcome you from the country, the clan and the tribe and the nation you come from and to all our brothers and sisters and we are all one mob, one tribe. We warmly welcome you from family, community, neighbourhood and the country you come from. We share little blue marble floating through the ever-expanding cosmos. We need to respect her. 
So on behalf of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, members, board, elders, welcome here today. <clears throat> Continue the good work you are doing because we need to, we need to um, have people belonging to society. If we marginalise them and disenfranchise them, it's not good for society and it's not good for them. It ultimately ends up in bad, bad conditions and bad situations. And you're seeing this playing out on the news at night, every night. So always was, always will be Aboriginal land, never ceded. Um, let's show the world what we can do when we appreciate diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Michael, for that beautiful welcome. Now, today we'll be hearing from the authors of this latest research, and this will be followed by a panel discussion to explore the themes raised by the research. We encourage you all to ask questions, whether you are here in the room today or joining us virtually. Now, this is all very interactive, so we're using the app Slido to gather questions, which I will then pose to the panelists. So how this will work is you can either access Slido uh, by downloading the app, or you can also join on slido.com. So use your phones, get them out and start uh, putting those questions through. Um, you will need a unique code to access the Q&A, and that is now on the screen. I would now like to introduce Daryl Karp, the CEO of the Australian National Mu Maritime Museum to deliver opening remarks. Please make Daryl welcome. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you, Uncle Michael, for your welcome to country. I, too, pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nations as the traditional custodians of the Bamal, the earth, and the Badu, the waters, on which we are today. I also acknowledge all traditional custodians of the land and waters throughout Australia and pay respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present. Minister Giles, distinguished guests and friends who have joined us either physically or virtually. Welcome to the Australian National Maritime Museum, Australia's Museum of the Sea. I am really delighted to be here. This is my first official speaking event in my new role as the director of the museum. And I can't wait to, to begin to um, explore the extraordinary stories and to share the extraordinary stories that the museum um, holds um, as part of the journey of moving forward with everyone here. Australia is one of the great migration nations. In fact, most of us um, are descendant from uh, immigrants. And here at the museum, we have an outstanding collection of exhibits, of objects, of artefacts, and more and most importantly, of stories of migrants. Um, and we honor them in our national monument to migration. We are incredibly proud to be partnering with Settlements Services International on the launch of the third installment of the Foundation of Belonging Research. This is really important research, which aims to shine a light on some of the impacts that COVID-19 has had on our new arrivals and newly arrived refugees, including the issues of family separation and reunion. And I know that there are going to be some pretty um, exciting findings and, and really interesting findings coming out of um, today's session and the research. It's really important to deepen our understanding of the experience of new arrivals in our country. And this research is part of a building block towards better understanding, towards connection and engaging with our newest arrivals and our newest community members. So we're pleased to be working with you, Violet, and the SSI on a variety of initiatives. These include, um, my apologies, these include the New Beginnings Festival, um, participation in the National Monument to Migration Program, and customized tours uh, to the museum to assist SSI clients to understand further how Australia's culture and history works. We are particularly passionate about telling the diverse stories of new, diverse stories of newcomers, and they are a critical aspect of our history. And they have shaped Australia in multiple ways. If you walk through our exhibitions, you will find in almost all of them a snippet of information, an insight, a story from people who were not necessarily part of 
the original story of Australia and add to the ongoing journey that, and the ongoing building of nation that we are today. But probably the most important element for us is the National Monument um, as a visible and important tribute to this migration heritage. We have over 31,000 names on 86 bronze panels that are joined together and run down the northern promenade of the museum facing Piermont Bay. And I really encourage you to take a moment to walk around there and to have a look at it. The quotes, the names, the journeys, the places that people have come from are very, very powerful. Um, and we really do encourage people to take a moment to reflect. Thank you all for joining us today to hear about our latest research findings um, and to contribute to the panel discussions that are going on. These re research findings and conversations that we all have amongst ourselves and here today are vital to the shaping of our nation. It shines a light on some of the impacts um, of the world around us on COVID, from COVID, but mostly it's, it's an opportunity, I think, for all of us to hear from those that we don't often get to hear about in the news, that we don't often get to see stories about in our museums. So I am really delighted to be part of this and to thank you for, for having it here at the museum. Thank you, Violet. Thank you, Daryl. Now today we are joined by the Honourable Andrew Giles, Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Please welcome him to the stage. Thanks very much, Lydia. And I had, well, I'll start with a confession. I, I really should have checked with Scott Morrison whether I am in fact the Minister <laughs> for Immigration, uh, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. But if you'll be so kind to proceed on that assumption uh, and, until he clarifies another decision that he may have forgotten about. Can I, can I, um, thank you, Uncle Michael, for such a generous welcome to country and, and the reflection you invited us, I think, really set the scene for the conversation that will take place today. And, and I join you in acknowledging traditional owners, paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledging the fact that this beautiful country always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, Violet, thank you for having me. Um, and um, for the opportunity to be part of this important conversation about really important research. It's a room full of important people, so um, perhaps you can all include yourselves in that while I acknowledge specifically Daryl, uh, our host, um, Lydia, our MC, Adrian from the UNHCR, Adama and Paul from uh, Rakoa, and, and of course, uh, Sukmani and all of those involved in the work that we are gathered here today to talk a little bit about. Um, the Australia that, that I believe in is a welcoming country uh, with a very proud tradition of resettling people in humanitarian need. A country that's resettled more than 930,000 refugees and humanitarian entrants since the end of the Second World War. And of course, these refugees these humanitarian entrants have made an extraordinary contribution to our country, nation building, bringing with them all of their skills, talents, education, and indeed their resilience. They have really built modern Australia in large part. It's impossible to imagine the country we live in today without these contributions. And a cornerstone of this has been the way in which we have sought to support humanitarian entrants, ensuring that people who arrive here in need, people who have been forced to flee, have the assistance and the services they need to settle into the community and make a contribution on their terms, um, including through humanitarian settlement program, um, the program which helps people integrate into Australian life by building the skills and knowledge they need to become self-reliant active members of the community, to share their perspective, share their experience and make their contribution. Now, the HSP is of course made possible by the network of contracted service providers who deliver the program in each state and territory, with case management that's tailored to the needs, strengths and goals of each client. Now, there's no doubt that the arrival of COVID in 2020 affected all of us and uh, it's very clear that it added much greater complexity to our settlement programs, including the HSP and other programs. Some of the additional support and networks, including those built around volunteers, 
reduce their services or unavailable to clients in need during the height of the pandemic. There was also, of course, a significant decrease in arrivals due to um, border restrictions and attended disruptions. Now, we know that some refugees and humanitarian migrants needed support from services for much longer than usual because of all of these impacts. We know that COVID challenged our understanding of service delivery as well as it cha challenging um, many of the other aspects of our day-to-day -day life. But I want to acknowledge a couple of things. Firstly, how service providers adapted to these circumstances, found new models of supporting people in need of support, uh, assisting clients with limited access to and familiarity with technology to build digital literacy skills, for example, increasing confidence and competence in using online services, which has been a positive and I believe will be a lasting outcome for humanitarian entrants. So in coming here today to kick off a conversation, I want to commend the workers in settlement services as well as those who direct their work for the extraordinary work that you've done over a period which has challenged all of us, but in which, in respect of which your work has never been more important. I think you know, but it's important that I acknowledge that your efforts every day make a real difference to people's lives and build a stronger, more cohesive and more connected community. So thank you. And I also thank you, coming to the point of this, uh, SSI and Western Sydney University for this latest research, the third instalment on to the impact of COVID-19 on refugee and humanitarian settlement and a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging that's so fundamental to everything we do and everyone's capacity to feel a part and accordingly to be a part of this community and this country. Now, as Daryl said, this is research that deepens our understanding and it's understanding that has to be deeper because these stories too often haven't been told. These perspectives, those perspectives of newly arrived refugees and humanitarian migrants need to be much closer to the centre of our decision making and much inform in a clearer way our national conversation when it comes to immigration and particularly our responsibility in a world which features now more people forcibly displaced than at any time in human history. Hearing these voices on their terms is absolutely fundamental to all the public policy goals and I believe to being the country we can and should be. So this research building on two earlier pieces of work has already provided valuable insights into the refugee and humanitarian settlement experience with a particular focus on the challenges of the pandemic and its lessons. I really do look forward to this discussion today and I thank the authors and all participants for their work. And as I anticipate the discussion that will play out today, I just really want to leave you with two thoughts beyond my thanks and appreciation. Firstly, um, that I see this event not so much as a launch, but as the commencement of a dialogue in which I hope to be a participant. And I also commit as I go about my work, as I go about my work to try and change the tenor of our national debate on these issues and support service delivery that's fit for purpose. I commit to relying on the insights that are contained in this research. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Minister Giles. It's great to have you here today. I would now like to introduce the lead researchers to present a summary of the findings for the third instalment of Foundations for Belonging research. Dr. Taig McMahon, Head of Research and Policy at Settlement Services International, and Dr. Sukmani Karana, Vice Chancellor's Senior Research Fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Um, I, Sukmani and I would also like to thank um, Uncle Michael West. It's not the first time I've heard you welcome me to Gadigal land. We really appreciate the way that you've welcomed us. And this is Aboriginal land, always was and always will be. Um, Sukmani and I will present a little bit on the research. It'll be a very quick presentation. Um, we're looking, we'll 
briefly outline how we, at, how we approach the research and some of the findings. Um, we are two of the authors of this research. The other authors are on the slide. The people that aren't on the slide are the refugee participants who actually participated in this research. We thank them from the bottom of our hearts for the time that they gave. In, and we also want to thank a group of SSI bilingual guides who were instrumental in actually gathering those perspectives. Those bilingual guides are the, the feet and hands, as it were, of SSI and the feet and hands of this research on top of the people who are listed as authors of the report. So, um, okay, so settlement integration. There's a lot of debate about what constitutes good or you know, best practice in terms of settlement integration. And often though, what we, have, what we found when we were establishing this program of research is that we found that there was a tendency to focus on some narrow areas particularly around employment and particularly around maybe English language acquisition. And there's nothing wrong with those outcomes and health. Those are all very, very important outcomes. But the evidence does point to the fact that settlement integration is in fact much more multi-dimensional than that. It's very tempting to think of just the one thing being the secret ingredient, but in fact there are many, many dimensions to settlement integration for migrants and for refugees. Um, the other thing that is very important to focus on is that it's a two-way process. It's as much about me as a non-refugee as much about people who are newly arrived to Australia. So it's actually a two-way uh, bridge between the people who are already here and the people who are newcomers to Australia. Um, and it's also a process that changes over time. It's not linear. It's not necessarily going in one direction. It can go in multiple different directions. And those of us who weren't born in Australia are very well aware of that. Um, this research, when we were looking at this research, we borrowed a framework or we used a framework for the UK, which we feel has a good, resonated with us because it has many dimensions. And it's an influential framework that was developed with re input from refugees, input from service providers and from policymakers. So next slide. So here is that framework, the UK framework of integration. And the research focuses, there, so there are many, many dimensions. So there's the, you know, the work and housing and education, the things that we often think of as outcomes in refugee settlement are, are placed on the top. Um, but then there are other elements that are also there. And our research focused mainly on the middle band, which is social connection, bonds, bridges, and links and then also the bottom area, which is the rights and responsibilities. Although we did look at other issues such as digital skills and digital inclusion as well at last year and in this year's research. Thank you. When we approached this research, we were interested in um, our, uh, the approach was to make sure that we had a survey design that drew on questions from other research. This allowed us to make direct comparisons. We also wanted to uh, um, look at the impacts each time that we've done this research we've had a different slightly different focus area and the focus area in this particular instance was on the impact of the pandemic on family reunification and family separation both of those things we've created in each of the phases of the research we've created a random sample a representative stratified sample to recruit participants importantly we've done a telephone survey and the telephone survey is the bedrock of each three phases, and we've used SSI bilingual guides because it's incredibly important that newly arrived refugees are able to participate in their preferred language, whether that be English or whether it be another language. And I think in each of the phases, probably well over 95% of participants participated in the first language other than English. And this year, each time as well, we have had um, a qualitative element. And this year, we complemented the survey with family interviews, which were also done by bilingual guides and which were led largely by Sukmani and her team at WSU. So here are the survey respondents to the survey. We had about 300, well, we had about, we had 314 um, survey responses. You can see the gender, the language, and the country of birth. Um, the gender is, pretty much what we would expect. The language and the country of birth um, is also what we would expect. Um, what isn't on this slide is that the, the average length of residency in this particular sample was four years, whereas the two previous phases, it was two years. 
The other thing that isn't on this slide, but just to be really clear for everybody in the room, everyone in this survey had permanent residency. This was people who were permanent residents of Australia. So just to be clear, when we're using the word refugees, that's, and, but they had different types of humanitarian visas, but all were permanent residents of Australia. Over to you, I think, Sukhmani. I think I'm up to there. Thank you, Tyke, for that uh, introduction to the research. And I'm also very grateful to the bilingual guides who were absolutely instrumental, not just within language support, but for having a relationship of trust with the refugees, which, as you all know, is very, very important for this kind of research. Um, to the refugee participants themselves for giving up, giving up so much of their time for the telephone service and um, seven other families subsequently for the interviews, which are presented as case studies in the report. Um, and also very grateful to my team at Western. We have an incredible administrative team, but also to the researchers, Liam, Shanti, and Emily, um, who helped at every stage of, of this particular research. Now, I'm interested now in presenting some in-depth findings on the three measures that TIG has laid out, the bonds, bridges, and links. When we talk about bonds, we're talking about how people are relating to people from the same community. So traditionally, when refugees arrive in Australia in the first couple of years, the survey findings indicate that they tend to have stronger bonds with people from the same ethno-linguistic community. Um, but as you can see from those figures on your slides, it has gone down in this latest phase of the research. And this is a direct outcome of being in Australia for a longer period of time. And it does correspond with similar research on this issue of social bonds. Also worth noting, and something I will also note in the policy recommendations, is that women tend to have stronger social bonds. That means stronger bonds with people from the same ethno-linguistic community um, than men. Um, and I think this is a strength that needs to be leveraged rather than thinking of this as something that needs to be um, a weakness or, or overlooked as, a, as an important finding. Um, next, we we'll look at what we call social bridges, which is essentially how newly arrived refugees relate to people from other communities. And this is also indicative of a change, of a longer period of settlement in Australia. The longer they're here, the more ease th there is in being able to relate to people from other communities, whether it's their neighbours or people at work um, or people that they relate to in their everyday life using transport or using the shops. So there is now a greater tendency also to talk to one's Australian neighbours. But again, here gender is an, a significant factor because women tend to have uh, weaker social bridges than men um, even after a significant period of stay in Australia, which is something again that needs to be noted and looked into um, and has correlation with other findings in terms of, um, you know, their use of digital services and so on. And finally, we move on to social links, um, which is something that was very significant in the second phase of Foundations for Belonging when we were talking about newly arrived refugees and their trust in various kinds of government and non-government services. It drew a lot of attention in the last phase because everyone was surprised, particularly the media, that, that refugees trust the government because it defies our understanding of, you know, refugees and what they, what they trust, essentially. But it is, that you know, this phase demonstrates, again, consistency because despite the pandemic, or you could say in this case, because of the pandemic, and I will explain why, um, there is still a lot of trust in institutions like the government and even the police, although trust in the media is a little bit lower than it was in the last phase. Um, now, the trust in government is explained by a lot of refugees being thankful for being in Australia during the pandemic and having access to a lot of um, support in terms of financial support if they lost their jobs or financial support if they were still um, accessing some kind of education. Um, next, we have um, more about social links. We, we, we looked in depth at what kinds of services 
newly arrived refugees were accessing during the pandemic. And we found that their use of digital media for talking to family and friends overseas, for using entertainment, um, and also for accessing news from their home country was relatively high. But they were weaker when it came to accessing welfare, health, and other kinds of government services in Australia. Now, in this case, age and gender are both significant factors because when you look at the gender breakdown, women, and particularly older women, uh, have greater tendency to be able to use digital services for talking to friends and family, especially family, but not when it comes to accessing these services, which is, again, something that needs to be considered in the recommendations. Um, but younger women were... Uh, younger women by and large from 18 to 24 years and also to some extent 18 to 34 years um, were doing well on this front. So that indicates that peer support or intergenerational family support could be useful for older women uh, when it comes to bridging this kind of digital divide. Now we're moving on to another important section of our research, which was about family reunion and separation. So we found that obviously because of the international border closures, people couldn't travel, but also people whose visas had been approved or people who had put in applications for, for family reunion could not join their loved ones in Australia. So as you can see from those two figures, there was a... Uh, there was a large section, I said, I would say the majority of people who had applied for or who had been waiting um, to be reunited with their family members overseas. And most of them were separa separated from either a sibling or a parent. Um, again, uh, similar to what I said before, COVID had really impacted their visa application process for family re reunification. About 54% said yes to this question um, and a further 29% said no. So a, a large majority of the uh, people who are newly arrived refugees were affected by the delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the border closures. Now, despite uh, most refugees being very thankful to the Australian government and supportive of the support they were offered, we found that refugees had higher levels of financial stress during the pandemic than the majority of the population. And this was especially the case when it came to expenses related to electricity, which you will see in the next slide, uh, paying bills and also other kinds of uh, services. What I also want to um, really emphasize here is that the other kind of anxiety which you might not really measure in other ways is anxiety related to family that was overseas. And we noticed this in the interviews as well. For the people who did have family overseas, especially in countries that were adversely affected by the pandemic, um, a number of them who were affected thought that worry about family was a serious problem. Um, and this was across board genders, men and women. Um, so I mentioned this just before, but again, this figure kind of emphasizes the, the differences from 2020 to 2021. The vast majority of uh, people had difficulty in paying their bills um, and accessing other kinds of services because of the pandemic. So compared to the rest of the population, they did face greater amounts of uh, financial hardship. And finally, what are the implications of this? I'm very pleased to hear that Minister Giles is interested in, you know, the findings of the research and the government is committed to improvement in the sector. So what we found, this is from the ba on the basis of this phase of the research and also the, the foundation that we're building on the idea of belonging and not just looking at the dimensions of education and work and other kinds of participation, but also the feelings or the, the measures of social and civic participation that are not easily covered by education and work. So that's what we mean by belonging. So one of the important ones that I mentioned earlier and I want to build on is with regards to connections among uh, communities which engage with women. So this is the social bonds aspect. So it's important to leverage those social bonds with a focus on women so that their social bridges and digital access skills can be improved. And the other one is more about what 
government can do in terms of improving the services, the digitally accessible services, which have really grown in uh, number and also grown in terms of the people that are accessing them post pandemic, because these need to be culturally responsive. So not just in language support, but they need to be intuitive so that people who've got uh, less digital skills can make use of these services and, you know, have a have a nicer, stronger, more pleasant settlement journey in Australia. That's it from us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Taig and Sukmani, for giving such a um, very insightful overview of that research. I would now like to move to the panel discussion um, part of this event. So I'd like to introduce our panel speakers up to the stage, please. Please welcome Adrian Edwards, the C uh, UNHCR representative for Australia, New Zealand, PNG and the Pacific. Adam Kamara, the deputy CEO of the Refugee Council of Australia. Yamama Aga, general manager, newcomers, settlement and integration at Settlement Services International. And again, Dr. Sukmani Karana. And just a reminder to everyone on how to interact and submit their question to the panel. So once you've downloaded the Slido app or opened the website link, please open it and enter the unique code, which is on the screen. And this will allow you to submit your questions to the panel, whether you are here in the room or online. So feel free to use your phone. Normally at an event, we tell you to put your phone away, but this time around, please get them out. those who are most vulnerable and I can only imagine how difficult it was for refugees uh, to navigate uh, you know the day-to-day -day during you know some of the hardest lockdowns we've seen in this country before um, so how did that impact your organization your workforce um, and the organizations you work with and how did that impact the way you provided the services that you usually do um, to refugees. Might just start off with you, you mama. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so, as you know, as Settlement Service International, we work with refugees, asylum seekers and other groups experiencing a vulnerability. During the pandemic, it was really, um, well, it was unprecedented. In a very short time, we had to move uh, hundreds of staff to um, remote working, and that has impacted um, on, on our service delivery and on our clients' um, outcomes as well in terms of how do we make sure that during a pandemic we need to still to protect the refugee uh, refugees from the impact of the pandemic and make sure that service delivery and service uh, uh, delivery um, is, is tailored to the needs and can um, meet um, basically their needs in, in to, instead of uh, uh, it just um, you know working remotely, not making sure that they they are accessing. So the success to uh, to doing this, we had to be um, you know it was uh, agility and innovation. We really needed to be uh, agile um, to in in terms of thinking of different modes of service delivery. Our staff had to go um, above and beyond the normal service delivery mode to ensure that refugees are receiving the um, right services during. Um, a harsh lockdowns where people were not able to move uh, from their houses and go anywhere. But also, um, you know, things that used to take, a, a, you know, half an hour a service task uh, was taken three hours because of the uh, digital literacy, digital access to equipment, and also, um, you know, all these issues are for refugees are. are uh, you know, it's a twin issue between, you know, the language barrier and digital access. While refugees, as we uh, can see in the findings, were able to um, connect with their communities through Facebook and different channels, it was more difficult um, to access government services and online services um, in terms of English language and, and access to equipment. So uh, for families who had children, they um, 
uh, learning from uh, from home was really a challenge because they had limited access to different um, equipment and uh, you know it, it meant that their children uh, need to access their English uh, their uh, school but also their parents who needed to access their AMP classes or access other services were impacted because there was limited access to some um, of the uh, digital yeah, I can imagine it was very challenging and everyone had to step up in some way. Um, Adrian, in, for the UNHCR, I mean, I imagine that you guys are not working necessarily directly with the refugee, but you're working with a lot of local organisations or grassroots organisations. Is that right? How was your you know, organisation impacted and how did your staff deal with the dramatic changes that we all had to deal with during the pandemic? Yeah, thank you, uh, Lydia. I think it's easy to forget already just two years out how extreme uh, it certainly was the per first period of pandemic and what an impact uh, it had uh, on all of us. Uh, the first impact on refugees, of course, was borders were closed. You couldn't travel. You could, where could you flee to became uh, an issue there. Now, I won't dwell on that for this question, but in terms of the impact on UNHCR, UNHCR does work uh, in the field uh, with refugees. Um, in fact, over the last 70 years, we've been there throughout and we work by this motto that you, you may have heard, this stay and deliver. Uh, but staying and delivering became extremely difficult uh, in the circumstances that we had. Uh, you didn't want to pass COVID on uh, to others. Um, uh, many people were pulled back, if you like, from we tried to minimize footprints and health risks in the environment. You also then had trouble moving staff from one country to another. So how did this all play out um, on people? Well, we saw in particular uh, increased risk for people trying to cross borders uh, in the first place. We saw uh, particular problems when it came to uh, the impact on GBV, uh, on child protection, uh, other areas like that where we simply didn't have enough staff in place. So in many ways, the same struggles that you saw typically in the health sector in having nurses and doctors delivering were playing out in the world of refugees and displacement. Okay. Interesting. And on a local in Australia, refugee, the Refugee Council Australia, how did that impact you, Adama? Um, so we're a national organisation, member-based organisation, and our role really was to try to understand how the pandemic was impacting on our members. Um, we have members who receive funding for the work that they do, and we have a lot of members who are actually charities. Um, and, you know, through their fundraising efforts, they're able to provide service. And we noticed there was a gap, and gap on people who are here on temporary visas, weren't eligible for a lot of the support that the government was rolling out. So we, um, you know, did a small research piece to try to understand what this looked like for those members who are charity-based and working with people who aren't eligible for government subsidies and what we found is that um this the, the those particular charities were going through their budgets were actually their, their financial re resources were, were, they were they were depleting really fast because the individuals who may not have accessed support previously from a charity who pre-pandemic were working supporting themselves now needed were the first to lose their jobs um, and needed to actually access financial support um, um, and be, you know, money to pay rent and all those things that you need to live and you know, buy medication and, be, and so on. So I think what we found is that the charities were, were saying, look, we're gonna run out of resources very quickly. We, we need the government to step in and actually ensure that people here on temporary visas are eligible for this, these resources. And, um, and we, I guess our advocacy work really, um, that informed our advocacy in trying to see at the federal level, but also at the state level, um, to see how um, people on temporary visas could actually be eligible. And what we found was that at the, at the state level, state governments actually stepped up to the plate. Quite a few state governments stepped up to the plate and were able to provide that emergency relief. Um, I guess the concern was that people, just to get by, were you know, accessing super, were getting significant amounts of debts post pandemic, how are they going to be able to service those debts? So whilst, you know, people are able to get through, get by, what happened, what lies ahead is actually quite concerning in terms of, um, you know, some people have depleted all their super. What does the future look like? But also how are you going to be able to service a debt when you are really on low income? Um, and how long, yeah, 
So I think um, we, we our, our focus was on advocacy and trying to ensure that people who did lose their jobs on temporary visas were able to, to get access to some support. And you say that the government stepped up and helped. At the state way. level. At, at the, the state, state level. level. How long was that support running for? Because, you know, the pandemic went on for such a long time. In fact, we're kind of still in it, let's be honest. Um, I mean, at what point it, does that stop or does that, was that continue? State, each state is different, but what we know is that it, it's, it's not an ongoing guarantee. It's, it's renewed. So there is a renewal process that the government, the state government would say, okay, this particular, um, we'll renew it for another six months or another period. So that, that uncertainty was concerning um, because you need that financial safety net. Um, everybody, COVID didn't discriminate who it impacted. Unfortunately, people on temporary visas who are in those jobs that lost, they lost their, their incomes. They lost their, yeah, they, they were the first to lose their jobs. So they were there for a longer period of time without income. So each state was different, but I think um, the fact that it wasn't a guarantee and that lobbying had to continue um, with each state government to ensure that, you know, they could provide that was, was, was a concern for us. Yeah, refugee organisations were incredibly important um, during this period is to make sure that no one fell through the cracks because they were dealing, a lot of these refugees by the sounds of things were dealing with issues probably for the first time um, that they might not have had to deal with before. Um, I'm curious to find out, did any of you guys experience worker burnout amongst your staff? And you know, because a lot of these organisations are volunteer based. Did any of you guys experience that? And how did you deal with it? I mean, I can speak from a community perspective. Um, I think what we saw is that people who, you know, you can give them titles of community leaders or bilingual, people who are really prominent in communities actually um, stepping in and trying to connect communities with accurate information about the pandemic, vaccinations, where to get emergency support. In some communities, there's a lot of stigma attached to, um, you know, if you were COVID positive, people not wanting to let anybody know, which actually limited the access to support. Um, and they might reach out to someone who they thought was a community leader for that support. So those prominent people within the community were the go-to for assistance and were in a pandemic for a very long time. So that burnout was quite obvious, well, is quite obvious that that would be a result. Um, I think those, you know, I think there was various, um, there was a lot of reliance on, on those, those, those individuals in those grassroots communities um, because of their access that unique understanding they have of how to communicate and engage with their communities and how to get the message across. Um, but also, um, and whether that's through, you know, small grants that were available or through different programs organizations had, and it was the same, it's usually the same individuals that are, are the ones who are being, um, who are targeted to, to provide that connection because of the trust and that level of access they have with communities. Um, and I think, People are tired, people are exhausted. Burnout has happened. And I think um, post COVID, we need to start thinking about how do we actually support these individuals and communities to recover from COVID? Because that resilience is fantastic that they were able to access that, but what's the impact on mental health? And if they are so key in connecting communities to services or to accurate information or resources, if they're not able to do it, what happens to the people they're connecting? I think, yeah, there's a lot to think about there. Um, so, Marnie, in your research, you you look at those social bonds and social bridges. What was it like, um, you know, for those refugees to connect with those services during uh, the pandemic? We've actually got a question about, you know, trust in the community and neighbourhood seems quite low from the research. What do you think contributes to this? Um, I think we can only speculate, but we do get some more data in the family interviews. So the trust in community and neighborhood is low because I think because of COVID restrictions, by and large in the community, there was a lower level of trust in the neighborhood and in the community, not just amongst newly arrived refugees. In fact, it fell in the by the population. So it's not surprising to see that it's lower in the refugee community as well. Having said that, the pandemic did contribute to um, this lower trust because people were just going out less. They had less exposure to their community and to their neighborhood. Um, but there was a greater reliance on or greater trust in the sources of government to give them information about the pandemic and to provide them financial support. So I think what was not trust in the community and the neighborhood translated into trust in the government um, and related services. What I also want to kind of emphasize here is that um, this kind of trust in community and government services 
Um, this is, while this is important, I think a lot of people who had applied for visas or who, had, who were waiting for family to come from overseas uh, were hopeful that it would, uh, that would take place. And we think that bonds and bridges are in two separate brackets. And if you're stronger on bonds or stronger, have stronger bonds with family and ethno-religious religious community, it would lead to lower connections with the Australian community. But what we've actually found is that when people do have the bonds, you know, with family members coming to Australia or when people are here with a lot of family in Australia or people who arrive on family sponsored visas actually have a higher sense of belonging and hopefulness than people who have higher levels of anxiety and worry about family that are stranded overseas. So I think it's important to emphasize when we are talking about bonds, bridges and trust that you know, bonds, better bonds lead to better bridges and better links. Mm. Adrian, did you want to add, I, th I felt like you wanted to say something before. <laughs> well, I, I was thinking it was a fascinating um, uh, time. You think back in it, those early days of the pandemic and in the country I had, I was in at that time, you had, for example, uh, every night at a certain time, you could hear windows opening around the neighborhood and people would be applauding people working in this. So there was a sense of community solidarity that was happening in the wider community. And we saw that reflected too in many places around the world with uh, refugees, because refugees, certainly in the initial part of the pandemic, were often uh, very much on their own. Their communities um, really mattered. I think of the camps in Cox's Bazaar, for example, where uh, you, with the Rohingya refugees there, you had many refugees organized to protect themselves uh, in that environment and did so um, showing incredible resilience and I think sort of creativity in that approach uh, as well. But how does that sort of create into this building bridges with the wider society. I think that is the struggle in many countries. And it's also, of course, the focus um, uh, of this report today. How do you make those bridges endure during a pandemic and during future pandemics? Um, I'm curious to also hear from you guys about uh, family reunions. That was a big point that you guys looked at in this report. Um, the pandemic, you know, we, we all felt that sense of isolation. Uh, and then I feel like that was probably exacerbated for a lot of refugees who were waiting for their family to um, to be reunited with their family. And they'd already waited many years, perhaps. Um, and now they had to wait even longer because the borders were closed. Can you tell me, I mean, all of you probably understand or have interacted with refugees who've had to experience that. Uh, just how significant was that impact on uh, refugees who had to wait f to be reunited um, during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. I can start. Um, from our experience from uh, with uh, working with our refugees and um, the communities, it, uh, it has been and it continues to be one of the main barriers and issues, family reunification and family separation. It's... Uh, so many people had granted their visas, but they couldn't arrive because of the border's closure. So that um, placed an enormous pressure um, and exacerbated the mental health and well-being for refugees here in Australia in terms of the separation from family and the reunification, but also in terms of the financial hardship because people were concerned about the safety and well-being of their families back home. But they also felt that they needed to support them while they, some of them lost their jobs here and there was a lot of pressure on them. There's also the pressure that to help them financially. So it was mental health, well-being uh, and, and also financial hardships. Adrian, I'm sure you would have seen all, you know, dealt with a lot of um, people who've had to wait even longer than they thought they would have to to be reunited with their family yeah that's that's right and i think and this report shows it that connections with family are absolutely critical and family unity really does matter it's so much a predict predictor as seen from the research of of mental well-being of uh of inclusion inclusion into the community that journey uh, that continues the protect protection journey um, that a refugee has. So it's absolutely fundamental. And I think quite clearly uh, what we know from our own experiences and from the experiences of refugees is that this has been a particularly difficult uh, thing over the last couple of years. Um, and and uh, I, I think does create a great deal of difficulty for a great, great many people. I yeah, I think um, this report does highlight the importance of, um, I guess highlights the family reunion 
opportunities in Australia and the way that the current, I guess, the current process for people to be reunited families is it's not working. I think COVID is one thing in terms of actually borders closing and, and so on, people being reunited, but there's, it's quite difficult if you are here, you separate a family, what are the pathways for you to actually be reunited? You can you know, apply through the Refugee Humanitarian Program, which has a very limited number of spaces. You can apply through the um, f Family Stream of the Migration Program, and there's a lot of barriers with that. The cost prohibitive, the documentation requirements, it's actually quite challenging. So um, I think what needs to happen, what, we, what we're saying at Refugee Council is that we, we need to start again with the, fam um, with, with the um, family reunion for, for refugees in Australia. Let's start, re let's actually start from scratch and actually rebuild a program that's informed, that addresses a lot of the challenges um, that people here are facing when it comes to trying to reunite with their families and, and separate it from the huma refugee and humanitarian program, have a separate family reunion stream, purely for family reunion purposes, because we know the benefits. We've, we've seen the benefits of actually being reunited family members and use that as a base to say, yes, being, re being with family is actually right. And let's use that to start a new stream that is not based on a limited number of spaces in a humanitarian program or really difficult processes um, under the family stream of the migration program. So, Kamani, in the research that you've done, what was the view about um, family reunification? Did, were there I any think the research, as everyone's pointed out, uh, overwhelmingly supports family reunification and, and shows and demonstrates the benefits of family reunifications for the individual well-being of refugees, their ability to settle in Australia, their ability to think about the jobs and education um, that, that would help build their future. Because when they're worrying about family overseas or sending you know, most of the most of the earnings that they have, they're in. A, they're desperate to get a job, whatever kind of job. They might be underemployed, but they're desperate to support family overseas. So they might not pick pathways that are ideal for their skills. So there's it impacts every aspect of their lives. Is essentially what the research suggests, and I think it's it's vital that you know pathways be found that are not through the refugee. Um, you know, reunification stream, because as uh, Adama said, the numbers are extremely limited in that stream. Other countries have other models. Uh, they all have limitations. Canada has the community sponsorship model. And the debate there is about do we go with you know, people most in need or do we go with the families of existing refugees? And I don't think it needs to be an either or situation. We definitely can find ways of doing both. I mean, during the pandemic, there was a pause on humanitarian visa holders being able to enter the country because of the border closures. Uh, how are we faring now? Is there still a backlog? What are you hearing? Um, um, I think um, Adrian would know more about this, but uh, there seem there definitely is a backlog because a lot of people were stuck in the queue. They're, either the applications were approved or the applications were put on hold. And the people we interviewed around November or December in, of 2021 uh, the vast majority of them were still waiting for the waiting to hear back from the the department about the status of their applications and um, we were in the process of interviewing one family who had uh, just arrived in Australia so there was the people that were arriving from Afghanistan um, because of the uh, bombing in Kabul but there was also others who had uh, started arriving there were still significant restrictions at the time uh, but as far as I know, um, it, you know, Australia has started accepting back those applications that had been blocked because of the pandemic. Yeah, Adrian, do you have anything to yeah, add? Yeah, I, I think many people in this room will know that traditionally there's three ways that you end the journey from being, ex from fleeing to finding belonging and inclusion uh, in society. And traditionally that's local integration, uh, voluntary return where it's possible and resettlement. Well, as we all know, uh, what's happened in uh, over recent years is local integration has become very difficult, uh, politically contentious in many cases, uh, with host countries not feeling they're sufficiently supported, or they have a community uh, will for that. Uh, a voluntary return, well, in an environment of increasing conflict, that's just difficult to do. The opportunities for that, they do exist. Uh, uh, we've had returns to um, uh, from Liberia to Cote d'Ivoire recently, but those are very rare. Uh, and then there's resettlement, which, if you remember, was designed to look after the most vulnerable people uh, out there, people who had already fled their home country into another country, but then were still at risk in that environment. And those places collapsed. They collapsed during the pandemic. Um, uh, 2020, 
I think we saw the lowest uh, resettlement globally that I've ever seen. Uh, uh, if you're in that, there is no queue to be a refugee, but if you were awaiting resettlement place, uh, it would take 40 years or so for the number of people who had that need for, to find a place. It was just ris ridiculous numbers, really. Um, so now we're in that period of recovery from that worldwide. And there's promising signals. The US, um, here in Australia, other resettlement countries, things are moving um, in the right direction. But we've a long way to go, uh, really. Uh, and it's meant a lot of additional suffering for people who, over the last few years, in normal circumstances, could have that solution may have been enacted and they could have found a pathway to a country that would resettle them. I'm just turning to some of your questions that are coming in. So thank you so much for putting your questions forward. Um, a question for your mama. Uh, what are the key service, what key services uh, priorities to facilitate culturally responsive work with families to facilitate feeling of belonging and improvements for older refugees over 65? What services um, are available to help those refugees? Well, as, as we mentioned, that uh, um, tailored services and making sure that in any um, program, the design of the program or the co-design should include a client voices and refugee voices. If it's a, a, a program for refugees or a service, they need to be included in the design. And um, also, the any policy should embed really the um, the needs for refugees um, of different cohorts and different groups to make sure equitable access to services. So if it's uh, um, you know a government service or even a settlement service, we need to make sure that we are we are tailoring the services to meet the needs of individual groups and cohorts uh, um, and organize like for example, we um, identified the needs for um, digital access and uh, well-being in that. Um, women were more isolated than um, than men during the pandemic and um, and impacted on their well-being. So we um, organized um, a programs with uh, uh, health services to make sure that there's online sessions to look at the well-being of women um, and to ensure connection between them and, and and others, but also to address their well-being. So really tailoring the um, their services to the needs of each group and cohort. Mm. During the pandemic, for that older cohort, to try and reach out to them, um, I mean, was it difficult during the pandemic, the, you know, relying on digital services instead? Was that easy to navigate for that cohort? No, it was very challenging for the older cohort. So uh, that's why we um, made sure that uh, right when the uh, when the pandemic started, we looked at um, ways of how do we how do we know we we were hearing a lot in the media that um, the multicultural community they're not getting the messages. So we surveyed about a uh, thousand people in in the program to um, ensure that they're getting the right messages or they understand what it's all about. And we found that the older people uh, actually there was a problem um, that they did not think that it's a, it's it's a big issue, COVID in general. So we tailored uh, programs for them, and um, we found also that the uh, individual connection, you know, not just sending them information in different languages, or it's just the individual connection from someone they trusted from someone they, who spoke the language made a huge difference. Do you have to go back to old school techniques and just phone them up? Is that what you're talking about? Over the phone, contact with uh, people, case managers, case workers who spoke the same language made a huge difference. I feel like during the pandemic, so resources like SSI, where you've formed bonds, already already established them, they, they really became quite important. It was really critical um, because they, there's the established trust and connection with those people yeah. and access to them. Is that something, Sukhmani, that you found in the research, that yes. those bonds that were already established, they were really crucial to get accurate and timely information out during the pandemic? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, part of the high trust we see in government um, and other, other kinds of institutions is because of the relationships that were already formed between the newly arrived refugees and services like SSI, 
Um, and that was not only persisted during the pandemic, but it was very, very crucial. To give you an example, when people found it difficult to pay a bill, for instance, we heard, heard, we heard stories of how SSI was critical as an intermediary in, in getting them access to you know, services that could help them pay the bills. So um, it was absolutely essential, I think, to have um, that, to have that trust with you know, the, the services that were already available pre-pandemic or that they were familiar with and that they could rely on for reliable um, sources of information as well as service. Yeah. There was great partnership and we've got a question from Cathy. Um, in New South Wales, we saw great partnership um, and collaboration between government and community leaders in communicating with communities. Um, I feel like I remember, we can all remember that 11 o'clock press conference and that was in English and I'm sure a lot of organisations went about translating that for their communities afterwards. Um, but how do we make sure that we sustain this approach? Is this something that we think, you know, that partnership is really important and we should continue it? How do we, how do, we do that? What do you think, Adamo? I think um, it's acknowledging the crucial role um, communities have in communicating with their communities and saying, look, we actually acknowledging that it is a partnership um, and that it's it's that important role, as I mentioned before, about communities knowing how to communicate, how to reach to their communities and knowing that if we are able to acknowledge them for the work that they do and provide resources for them to do that work, it can actually continue. Um, I've never seen so much translated information in my life until COVID and it's actually fantastic. So, you know, all the challenges that there was before about translating information, the challenges were addressed during COVID, so let's continue doing that. Um, we were able to identify who these communities are and develop relationships with them because it was really important in actually reaching out. So let's maintain those relationships. Um, and those relationships need to be maintained, not just because if I'm a service provider, I've got a project that I have to do in six months. It's actually about maintaining that relationship for the long term and understanding that that relationship is my access to information and understanding of what's happening in the community, if and when I need to actually communicate with that community, because it's about relationships as well. And I think the other side of it is that, yes, there was a great partnership. I just, not to be negative, but also understanding that a lot of this work that was done by those community leaders was voluntary. And that's not fair. Like it was, it was crucial for, for in, in um, at the heart of the pandemic. It's crucial to get information out because we all, it's everyone in, right? We all needed to do what we can to ensure that um, we we hit this pandemic and you know the numbers go down and everyone's safe and so forth. But as a long term strategy, I don't think that that's sustainable. We need to ensure that um, if you if we are going to rely on these community leaders and community groups that there's some resourcing there if it's required some will, will be happy to continue to say this is how we operate but they need resourcing as a community organization I mean you have to somehow someone's got to pay the bill if you're going to be meeting now that we're meeting to pay face to face or someone had to pay for that zoom account um, you know you need insurance you need small catering there's there's resources to run these groups and these things so there's got to be some resourcing and there were some smaller grants that they were provided but let's and they were easier to get it was the easiest grant I've ever had to write when I was writing those grants and it was fantastic that it was actually you could get it so quickly so those systems that were in place continue that post pandemic because we know that the, re the post COVID recovery is just as important as a COVID period so I think continue what we're doing but also acknowledge that on a bigger scale, if we want to continue this partnership, resourcing needs to be put there for these community groups and community leaders. For sure. I think everyone appreciated the hard work of community leaders and what they had to do. And I think it's very important, you know, both ways for the community leaders to uh, speak to their communities, relay the information from government to their communities, but also the other way, if community had issues, to speak to that community leader and to pass that message on back to government. It's, it's really important, that role, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what the solution is, but does it need to be, is it you trying to say that they need to be embedded into government? They need to be... Uh, Absolutely. It's a dialogue. Yeah. It's, a, it's a dialogue. It's a relationship and it's an ongoing relationship. It's not just, we have this crisis, let's work out who we need to talk to, see you later. It's an ongoing dialogue because if it's an ongoing dialogue and we have understanding both ways, then we can really address some of the, the issues that are happening and we can actually, that co-design word, all those different buzzwords that are used, that's the way forward. Yeah, we want to make sure we're not, I imagine this time is a bit of a scramble and next time when another crisis arises, we don't want to go through that. So 
Hopefully, yeah. I don't know what the solution is, but maybe people can start thinking about that, how we don't, yeah, face that um, challenge again. Um, and another issue that this report looks at that I'm really interested in is digital skills. Um, and I think we take that for granted. Um, for many Australians, we use our phones, we just automatically started signing into places and it was really easy for us. But for a refugee, um, what's the digital literacy, first of all, of these refugees? Anybody? So it does vary a lot across the cohort. I think we have to look at age and gender as well as, you know, what country that they come from. And we've noticed, as you can see from the survey findings, that women and older women and older people across the board have lower digital literacy. Uh, when we're talking about digital devices and digital literacy, we have to look at the access, the affordability, as well as the skills. So what we saw during the pandemic was that many organizations came together to, to address the access aspect of this literacy. Um, organizations like Westerly they, they, and many local councils started providing devices to families that were in need. And the survey does show that we had perhaps sufficient devices per household. But when we dive deeper into the data, and we look at the number of tablets and laptop computers that children might need, for instance, to have uh, remote schooling, there, there was probably insufficient. That's one aspect that does need to be considered. And the other one was, as we've mentioned, the literacy or the digital skills of uh, older people, particularly women, when accessing government um, and non-government services, particularly related to health and welfare. Having said that, the interviews did show some aspects of digital literacy that we were surprised with and that, again, could be leveraged. We could have a strengths-based approach to uh, addressing some of these digital skill gaps. For instance, we found that many of the refugee families were relying on Australian government sources for information about COVID and how to wear masks correctly, where to get vaccines, what was the correct protocol to follow with social distancing and relaying it back to their family overseas because they, the family overseas thought that the information they were getting locally was not reliable or there was a lot of misinformation. So that was um, an interesting finding and perhaps something that could be leveraged for, for future, future service delivery and advocacy in this area when we're talking about digital literacy. So if they do rely on government so uh, heavily and, and trust government, perhaps the services that are available could be more culturally responsive, could be more intuitive so that they can use it for their welfare and health needs. Um, but I think also more could be done formally as well as informally for women in, in these families to be able to have access to devices, not just, you know, share. I mean, there's a lot of sharing between siblings, but also uh, women often don't don't get you know, first priority when it comes to just having access to a tablet or a laptop. So access could be addressed, but skills, skills could also be addressed because uh, the younger people in these families could provide peer-to-peer -peer and intergenerational learning. And the social bonds that the women that already have um, could could be another you know a play, uh, could be another aspect where their digital skills could be um, you know worked on. So if there is a, a meeting happening in a religious place, then that meeting could be turned into um, an informal workshop for these women. So I think those opportunities need to be found amongst the networks that they already have to access um, to improve the skills aspect of digital literacy. I, I want to touch on that point about access, um, especially for children. Uh, you mentioned during the pandemic, we know that a lot of kids had to homeschooling became the norm for them. Uh, but you said there's a lot of sharing amongst siblings. Um, and as a journalist, I remember covering, you know, stories about year 12 students studying from home, but they're, and they might have a laptop themselves and their siblings might have laptops as well. But for refugee families, I think the research showed that there was a lot of sharing. Um, on a grassroots level, say at SSI, how were you able to help overcome that challenge? Well, it, it was a challenge and refugee families, some of them had, or well, some of them come with some smartphones. They are provided with uh, a, a smartphone when they arrive through the humanitarian settlement program, um, but one per family and it's not, you, you know, the data is an issue there. Access. So it's not just having the equipment, is the digital literacy to be able to use the equipment, but also the, the data 
that they needed to access. So not all of them had, it, it, it was one of the issues. A high quality that, data. That high home, quality yeah. and the access and the speed. Um, so all these were issues, but also um, the limited number of equipment where we, we found that, you know, some of the children were accessing online so, uh, online studies and learning, so which meant that their parents could not access the AMEP classes. So. Um, I know that um, AMEP provided some equipment at, at some stage as well, but also we had a lot of generosity from the community and donors who um, felt really they needed to help. And we had a lot of donations of uh, uh, refurbished laptops and, uh, and and mobile phones during the Afghan crisis. So we, um, it, we donated uh, refurbished laptops that was really great to um, get people access to learning and uh, you know increase their independence and access to different services. Mm. Thank goodness for the generosity of communities, hey. It was just amazing. Yeah, right. And Adrian, I mean, globally, I imagine this was an issue as well, access, digital access. Absolutely, it is, and I, I think you heard part of the answer. There is is the need to be able to um, address this need. Uh, uh, what we we did some research, um, UNHCR, with Accenture back in 2016 into uh, how refugees were using smartphones. And 2016 is not that long ago, but uh, it was in an era where the notion that a refugee should even have a smartphone was being questioned. Um, and what they found, of course, was that. Um, a smartphone for a refugee was as important as food, as water, as, as shelter, um, because it was those essential connections to family mm. and to to everything else to be to have some degree of agency in in what was happening to them. And you see the same, uh, I think, play out uh, today. It's a real struggle with um, with older um, refugees and how how does one uh, deal with deal with that. But I think the goal is to make sure that we don't have a gap in provision of uh, internet access and the, and the tools uh, to do this. And the last point um, uh, on this, uh, and this perhaps won't be a surprise, but what we have found in our research into this is that learning how to use other services and utilit utilitarian side of, of internet access often starts with being confident in the informal and the sort of leisure use of internet access, including for sort of older populations. So it's a spectrum uh, of access, which I think we, we have to look at. And, and frankly, I think we're at a sort of point in 2022 where we, we have to get over the notion that these things are uh, an entitlement. They're, they're more in the area of, of right if we disconnect from the internet for a month. It's hard for us to feel our place in society. It's the same. Uh, for someone who's displaced. Thank you. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so I've got heaps of questions, but um, we'll start with, so could you tell us a bit more? So this question is from Diana. It's about refugees in regional areas. Could you tell us more about the regional aspect of belonging? Which one do you have more? Um, I think that Adama might be in a better position to oh, answer Adama, that okay. question, but I, I do think that uh, just broadly speaking, not from this particular piece of research, I think there's regional communities that are providing a lot of support to resettled refugees um, throughout regional New South Wales that, you know, SSI has worked with. So uh, sometimes regional communities do provide that kind of trust in community enableliness that many in the cities don't, uh, in addition to providing employment, which is also uh, an important contributor to belonging. Um, from the work we do, um, we, we have offices in regional in New South Wales in Armidale, um, Newcastle, and Gulf Harbour, and the um, uh, refugee belonging is really strong. Um, we have um, we have done. A, 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 I take an example in in Armidale, We have done um, a study with the University of uh, New England. Um, since um, the uh, 2018, when the first wave of uh, Yazidi refugees arrived in Armidale, and we did this study of uh, six waves, and uh, the study looked at um, uh, really looking at the pulse of the host community and how they feel about refugees, and in 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 turn um, also how do refugees feel in Armidale in Armidale as a community, and the the sense of belonging is is really strong and high 
and higher than the um, the average of the other longitudinal study, which is the beginning a new life in Australia. So people feel really connected. They feel that they can speak to their neighbours. They feel that they can, uh, they feel part of the community, and they feel welcome. It's it's really strong. Fantastic. Um, and another question, impacts on families may present through child safety or child protection. What services need to, what do services need to do to ac uh, access and preserve family safety? Any thoughts on family safety? Well, again, in, in terms of uh, how do we make sure that in terms of the assessment and ongoing communication and um, tailoring and co-design of services, um, it, you know, services should be really tailored to each individual needs and uh, um, uh, looking at, um, you know, the different modes of uh, um, delivery, it's to ensure that no one is missing or, um, it, you, you know, the way of communication, how do we do assessment with families and continue to provide education on safety and well-being and make sure that um, the, the information provided are, uh, you know, appropriate in terms of the culture and language and the way we deliver the, the mode of delivery as well. In summary, we're going to getting to the words the end of this panel discussion. I'm, I would like to hear from you guys about you know we've gone through a very challenging period, COVID obviously, and we still are in it. Um, how do we make sure that some of the I mean difficult starting points we don't go through that again? The difficult times that we had in the beginning. What can we learn from the process moving forward so that we're not scrambling to turn to community leaders to get the message right or to navigate through misinformation? What can we learn? Do you have any advice for the government or other stakeholders who are listening today? Adrian? Well, if, if I can speak at the international level, one, I think when we're faced with a pandemic or a crisis like this, we have to have a means to, if we can't stop wars, and let's, let's face it, there was some talk in the early part of the pandemic of maybe wars will stop as well. Everyone's, uh, you know, self-isolating at home, <laughs> right? It didn't happen. Uh, so those continued, persecution continued. We have to have a means and preserve a means for dealing with that. And I think governments have to have within their programs some recognition that even in times like that, uh, you need a channel through which you can help um, people. That's, that's probably step one. I think uh, the connectivity issue that we spoke about, the digital inclusion, incredibly important in this environment because it's played over the course of this pandemic here in Australia into the um, mental uh, health issues that many families have suffered. Are they able to keep in touch? Are they uh, uh, able to relate? That sense of isolation that people have had, all the more important today. I, I'll maybe stop at those two points, but I think there's plenty others. Um, um, I guess from my perspective, I think that a lot of fantastic work has been done. P um, organizations um, were able to innovate, find a different way of providing a service. And I think it's about those good things that have worked is continuing to do them. So, um, and also trying to continue to work to address the gaps. We talked, I've already talked about translations and work relationship building and, and engagement with communities. Um, things like highlighting the need for digital devices that's that's a gap that's been um you know work towards that you know so i think it's learning from it and embedding it in our practice and then what the gaps are continuing to address it because the shame would be not to learn the lessons we've learned and actually grow grow in what we do as um in, in our service delivery yeah from a researcher kind of big sky point of view, I think what COVID has shown is that COVID has amplified some of the inequalities that existed pre-COVID and some of the problems that pre-existed COVID. So I guess what we have to learn is to realize that these problems existed before and have become even bigger problems now. So what do we do about it so it doesn't continue? And one of those is obviously people who arrive here without family support or non-202 visas, um, as one of the questions has uh, raised. So it's important that the family reunification uh, needs to be looked into and needs to be expedited. Digital, digital inclusion, um, as as Adrian has pointed out, should be something that's included in the settlement program and shouldn't be just an add-on or just a matter of providing a smartphone uh, per family. 
Um, and and finally, also, I think as I mean, I'm summing everyone's points in some ways. But uh, but Adama, I think you made a very excellent point about community leaders. We we saw in the lockdown in Melbourne when the towers in Flemington and North Melbourne uh, were in harsh lockdown that the younger refugees and migrants really stepped up and provided not just translation services, but coordinated a number of services for the people that were in lockdown. So those um, kinds of intermediaries who uh, have access to, you know, the language support, but also to both kinds of groups uh, to be leveraged, resourced properly so that that kind of formal, informal support, training, feeding back to the community can carry on uh, beyond the most, you know, the the most crises points of the pandemic. Well, um, for me, uh, COVID-19 had so many negative impacts, but one of the positive impacts is that um, it was an opportunity for services and for people to be innovative and to think differently. And I think for all services that um, have had to change the way they work, and that has changed permanently. It's not going to be just for a short time and going back to the old way. Many services and organizations will not go back to working full time from the office. We'll, we'll adopt a, a hybrid model. So um, in, in adopting new models of services, you know, the, the needs for refugees and communities should be in, embedded in the code design and making sure that they don't miss out on um, on services because of the way uh, services are working, whether in terms of uh, digital inclusion or services from, from from government or others. And just to pick up on the community leaders, uh, you know, there's a lot of coordination, a lot of collaboration and great work that happens, but we need higher level of coordination. Um, during the pandemic, we saw that you know, many services and many government departments were relying and going and reaching um, out to the same community leaders, which created the burnout. Mm -hmm. the, those same community leaders were contacted by everyone to deliver the messages. So if we can have, uh, you know, a bit of more centralized process or higher level coordination to ensure those individuals who are not resourced, who don't, who doing this on a voluntary basis are not burnt out because of many people reaching out to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you please put your hands together for our panelists today? Thank you so much, John. Feel free to take the seat. Well, thank you so much to our panel. Feel free to take a seat if you want. Um, thank you to our panel for that insightful discussion. I hope you all took something away from that. Um, it's clear there's a strong sense of ideas there to help us uh, move forward um, uh, as we work with refugees in your various organisations. Thank you to our audience uh, for sending through your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them. Um, and But feel free to... Uh, stay in touch afterwards and discuss amongst your peers. Um, I would now like to invite the CEO of Settlement Services International, Violet Romiliotis, to deliver closing remarks. Please put your hands together for Violet. Thank you, Lydia. Um, hello, everybody. Well, we've had an extraordinary discussion uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, I want to thank you again for another very generous and inclusive welcome. It's always such an honour to, to, to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much to our extraordinary panellists, Adama, Adrian, Sukmani, and your mama. Um, I think that you were able to really bring to life with your diverse lens, your expertise, uh, what these findings really mean for us in, in our environments, whether we're service providers or citizens interested in this, whether we're from government. Um, Lydia, thank you for guiding us through our program today and coming out of your maternity leave to, you know, to, to do such a great job. It's always uh, wonderful to have you and your insights. And thank you very, very much. And it was a great honour to have the Minister come. I think it's great to have a Minister with a sense of humour. That's nice. Uh, but also, um, I, I think somebody who uh, really uh, is really well embedded in the issues um, and takes a global and a local perspective, which is very important, and to value research, because we know that evidence base is critical uh, for all of us in the work that we do in our perspective, because it's the evidence and the data and those insights 
because they're from those that we are meant to be serving. They are speaking and telling us what they need rather than us uh, creating what the priority should be. Um, you know, today's event is taking place in a world where the global need for resettlement vastly exceeds available places. And we heard uh, Adrian's, uh, you know, numbers. Last year, UNHCR identified 1.4 million people in need of resettlement and less than 58,000 were resettled. It's a really extraordinary situation. Australia's resettlement program last year was the smallest ever. Uh, we only, in 45 years, 6,000 people were settled. Um, thankfully, the Albanese government is telling us that their plex are increased for humanitarian numbers. We welcome that, absolutely. It is very welcome news. And we hope that at least 27,000 will start coming. We've got a community sponsorship program as well, which is, uh, is uh, additional numbers, which is critical. But it is a drop in the ocean. It really is just a drop in the ocean. But we have to start somewhere. We need to be optimistic. As a responsible global citizen, Australia has played a critical role, but it, it can play a much larger leadership role and really lift the bar. Um, there is a global humanitarian crisis. We do need to find solutions so these crises don't occur. But as Adrian said, we always find, as humans, ways to start wars and to cause trauma. Uh, but if we can uh, have government and sectors that are expert in what they're doing and working collaboratively with our diaspora communities uh, to actually find solutions when, when people do arrive. Research by Foundation for Belonging, SSI invests in research because we know that it is the way to help us and we know many of our sister organisations doing this important work across the country, some here today, some joining us online, thank you, uh, that uh, we need to co-design and work with community to provide good services that really help people meet their potential and live good lives in the lives that they want. I'm very proud of the work that's been done, led by our very own Dr. Tide McMahon, an extraordinary colleague and wonderful at his work, uh, and the SSI policy team. And uh, Dr. Sukmani Kurana, thank you very much. It's a pleasure listening to you and Tide in your presentations. And thank you very much to the Institute for Culture and Society at the University of Western Sydney. We're great fans of that university generally and, uh, and this work. Um, I also want to thank Rakoa, Akos and Skoa for spreading the word for this event today. We really value our colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, in particular, Adama, for your comments. Uh, I think we're an organisation, we know we are a service provider, we are expert in what we do, but we wouldn't be able to do half the work we do without good collaboration with other service providers, with our community leaders, with um, refugee-led organisations and f individuals and families who um, really inspire us uh, and really are, are the reason why we exist. So thank you very much for coming and, sp and spending some time with us uh, and uh, have a good afternoon. I think we're, we're going to go off and have a little snack. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. I've got to say Daryl. Oh. Our hosts. <laughs> no, no, it's very important. Thank you so much uh, because we, we've had a wonderful partnership. You have a wonderful team and we know we're going to have a wonderful relationship with you too, Daryl, as we did with Kevin. But uh, you have a wonderful team and we've um, had wonderful partnerships and, uh, and activities. But we really thank you for uh, honouring this research and, uh, and we look forward to many uh, wonderful events together. So thank you very much. Well, that concludes the formalities for today's event. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. You can view the research on SSI, SSI's website. And for those in the room, there are hard copies uh, available here. To those of us joining online, this is where we say goodbye. Thank you for listening and for your questions. And to those of us here, as Violet said, please stick around. Um, we invite you to join us for a light lunch being served at the Tasman Lights Gallery, which is at the back of the room that way. So thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.